the current group of children ages 10 to 20, known as the Facebook generation, in a recent survey say that they spend on average around seven hours on social media a day. That's anything from checking Twitter to watching a blogger on YouTube to scrolling through a forum. With as much of a hold on the modern adolescent, a question of purpose comes into play. The internet is vast and holds information like a steel trap. Once something is put out there, it can be tough to rid that post from existence. For this reason, it is very important to have default strategies for how to present yourself online. According to the Pew Research Foundation, 73% of modern teens possess a smartphone. That is, with access to the internet, apps, and music all from their mobile device. Only 15% have no phone at all, and the rest are the last of the flip phone and slide phone users. With a wide majority of teens utilizing cell phones and social media, news, videos, and other content is circulating faster than ever before. I actually really like YouTube, so I follow a lot of YouTubers. I like looking at other people's posts way more than I like posting. Being able to, instead of having actual conversations in person, they have them all like, online through your pictures or videos. Uh, looking at tweets or posts on Instagram, sometimes occasionally Facebook, if I'm bored. I just like the pictures that they post and I like knowing what's going on. Like, I just enjoy seeing what other people like to share. Heavy concern over connection to technology has pressed for some form of self-discipline within individuals. Overuse of technology has been compared to an addiction in habit and physical behavior, and many fear that it is impeding the more hooked individuals from leading normal lives. It's a need. It's not like an everyday need to be on social media. It's like you see your friends at school, you can see them during the weekend, you don't need to be on social media to talk to them. Definitely more addicted to social media. Mm -hmm. It's what a lot of people just focus their minds on. Um, you can, on, well online, you, act, you can act like a completely different person than when you're in person. It gets annoying when people post things every day. I'm just like, stop, I don't want to see you. I don't want to be that annoying person that posts three Instagram posts in a day. Now more than ever, schools like Greenfield Central are connecting to the virtual learning curve, providing a laptop for every student connecting teacher to pupil, student to student, and everyone to a unified learning environment with technology. Teenagers are connecting on and off screen, trying to share what they find most noteworthy to their own lives. So like, if it's funny or if I think like what someone says is actually true about life or something like that. I definitely use hashtags more on Twitter. Like this big thing at my church right now is hashtag bless the world. So I've been using that to kind of share cool things that I see. I think they connect like through like the experience I have like if they might do something together they might have fun together and they might want to redo it more and the more they do it the more friends they make. Many vines are mainly funny people so that's where they're going to have a lot more followers. I think that their posts represent who they are and you shouldn't represent yourself badly on social media because that's what a lot of people look at to gauge your personality and such. There's also a danger in posting online with hostilities abound. Cyberbullying has become a strong concern for educators who have set teachers in place on various social media websites to monitor students. Being mindful of what you post online could determine your social media presence. I feel like future employers, they just see like you posting a bunch of rude comments or cuss words. They're not going to be like, oh, that's a person I want to hire. They're just going to be like, what are you doing with your life? You can never take it down. It's always going to be up there. So what can be done to protect your privacy online? Be sure to check your privacy settings on social media, know who follows you, and don't be afraid to block hostile users. Look out for red flags and always think before you post. Going on social media is a bad idea when emotionally compromised. Think before you type, just like how you think before you speak. In the past decade or so, there has been a dramatic shift in the area of music. It's becoming more and more easy for artists to record at their homes. Digitally recording at home has become a staple in the world of music now because it produces great results at a fast and cheap rate. I recently discussed this topic with my musical partner, Harrison Current. How long have you and I been playing music together? We have been playing music together for about hmm, seven or eight, seven, seven or eight years.
ever since about around fifth grade is when I, I when we first were in our first band together we first started playing right um, a lot of music together we were just in a, in a cover band set up by our, our guitar teacher we were we we all were like do you want we want to be in a band I mean we, we all played guitar and we were all ready to take that step into our uh, in, into our musical careers so yeah we wanted to be in a band so we uh, we all banded together and uh, figured that out how have you seen music production and recording evolve over the years? I I honestly hadn't seen, I, I haven't seen the full spectrum of that because a lot of the newer ways of recording already existed when I started started doing things like that. Um, I um, but just in history we've we've had analog and we and that's all thrown out now. Barely anybody uses that. I mean, the only the only reason people use analog equipment and not digital is for the sake of it being analog, and um, I, and I, I've honestly seen the, uh, the the digital side of it get better, and it, because obviously you're gonna have bugs and things like that. Um, even even when I first started g recording in GarageBand, just like songs and things like that that I've written, I I've seen a huge step up in software and the types of devices that you're using to, to do this production. Okay, we're going to use GarageBand to demonstrate how easy it is to make music digitally. Okay, the first thing you're going to want is a drum track. Here's what I have so far. The next thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to add a piano track to this drum loop. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to add bass to this um, drum and piano. I'll give you a sample of what it sounds like before I start recording. thing we're going to add is this synth. It, it sounds a little different like this. It's going to add a different and interesting texture to what we're already doing. And I might even move it up an octave actually. All right, here we go. Okay, the next thing we're going to add is another synth, but it's going to be different as well. It's going to sound like this. It's going to bring a nice swell to what we're doing, make it more dramatic. Here we go. So it looks like we got plenty of tracks lined up, but we just need to add one more thing. I'm going to add one more percussion kit. It's going to be this uh, the cymbal right here. Just to get a more, you can get more of a feel for the song with more percussion. So we're going to do that. Okay, so this just proves that you can create anything within like five minutes on like something digital like GarageBand, and it just allows for artists to be as expressive as they want to be with as little time as, as you want or as much time as you want. So let's go ahead and listen to what we've made in just around like five minutes. This just goes to show that you can do anything in like uh, on like a digital audio workstation like GarageBand or Logic Pro or Reason or anything like that. Um, and it just allows for artists to be expressive as they want to be at a relatively affordable price. 
So this is, this is great stuff for musicians everywhere around the world. Sneakerheads are best to find as someone who buys more sneakers than they need, usually many more pairs. They appreciate the design of shoes more than the average person and can usually distinguish real shoes from fakes or replicas. Hi, my name is Noah Evanoff and I am a sneakerhead. And today I will be sharing with you my top five shoes in my personal collection. So the first shoe I was starting off with is the LeBron 10 Sprite Low, which released about summer 2013. Um, the reason I like this shoe a lot is because this, it's like a turquoise blue with a neon yellow on the bottom and an air bubble, which matches a lot of the blues and the yellows that you wear. And it also was one of my first shoes that got me into collecting. So that's why I like it a lot and it's stayed in my collection ever since then. Um, as you can see, we got speckles on the midsole and paints and also spots on the um, shoelaces. Um, yeah, and it's got the LeBron logo on the tongue in the bottom. And my next one, my number two, my number four is my Kobe 8 purples, my TD purples, which released around Octo which released around October 2013. And the reason these are one of my favorite is because I like to play, I play basketball, and this is one of my favorite shoes to play basketball in because it has a comfortable bottom. As you can see, it's got nice padding there, and nice padding on the inside. And it's just, it won't hurt your feet when you're playing basketball, and it allows a lot of movement and a lot of like easy cuts to the rim and stuff. So yeah, you got the Kobe logo on the top, the Nike on the side, and the Kobe Bryant signature on the back with the logo, another Kobe logo, the reflective Kobe logo on the back with, and I don't know if you can pick this up, but it says Kobe Bryant 24 right there. My number three shoe, my number three shoe is the Jordan 3 Powder Blue, which released January of 2014. Um, the reason I like this shoe so much is because it's really easy to wear. You can go with just about any pants that you wear. And it's nice, has a big tongue, and it's suede, or the material's the suede. And so like, if it's suede, suede looks nice with a lot of jeans and denims. So you got that. And you got the hints of elephant print around above the midsole and above the t below the toe box right here. And the blue, the powder blue colorway goes with a lot of the stuff that you'll wear. And as you can see on the back, we got a, the Nike, the Jordan Air with the Air. And we got the Jumpman on the front tongue. And we got Jordan logo on the bottom. And the stars on here to show how much you've worn them. So if you've worn your threes a lot, then some of the stars are going to be fading. But I haven't worn these a super lot, so these stars aren't fading very much. And creasing also shows that if you've worn them a lot. And as you can see, these aren't creasing very bad at all. So I haven't. you can tell that I haven't really worn these but a few times. So here I got the Jordan 11 Gamma, which released around, which was the, actually the um, holiday release for December 2013, which released on Christmas Day. And what this is, is the 11, the Jordan 11 releases one holiday release every year. And so this was the release for 2013. And the reason these are the most popular shoes is because Jordan wore them and went after he won his back to after his third his sixth title he won a sixth title in these and so he wore these also like we could you'll see pictures of will smith in them and a bunch of other superstars in them wearing like with tuxedos because they were known to be worn with weddings because they were a dress shoe because of the patent leather around it and then it's got the 23 on the back the jordan tag on the front between up in the up at the third lace hole and then the Gamma Blue Jumpman on the side right there. And then it comes, these, the shoe always comes with the shoe tree to keep it from creasing when you're not wearing it from old age and keep it from cracking and stuff on the inside. So it gives it almost a firm base when you're not wearing it. And then on the blue, it's a little yellowed, but we got an icy sole on the bottom, which is a sole that comes a darker blue comes as a darker blue and the more you wear it, the more yellow it becomes. So when exposed to oxygen, it oxidizes and becomes yellow and rain also helps it oxidize. So if you wear these in the rain, they're going to yellow a lot quicker. But if you want to, there are ways to re-ice them and make them blue again. So yeah, and we also got carbon fiber, the shank plate right there, which also gives you, like if you're gonna wear these in basketball ever, then it'll give you some reinforcement there around the bottom because it's all over the bottom right here. It'll give you the reinforcement with the rubber midsole. 
So, and then my number one shoe is the Kobe 9 High Influence, which was Kobe Bryant's, it's Kobe Bryant's ninth shoe. It's the Elite, and it's the, um, it was influenced by Kobe. So here, as you can see, it's got lots of vivid colors, lots of different abstract um, pictures almost on the midsole right there. And as you can see, the bottom has Kobe's foot. It has actually Kobe's foot lined into it on the bottom to see like, I don't know, just to see like what Kobe's foot looks like. And on the side, we got the Nike sign and the Kobe Bryant, the KB ninth on the back, which shows that it's his ninth shoe. And as you can see, this goes up to about an ankle, about your, or your lower calf, upper ankle. To, the reason he made it so high is because he tore his Achilles in the Kobe 8 and he ha he wanted to have Achilles support for his next season that he played in with these so he made these so he could have some support in his Achilles so it didn't tear again so it didn't hurt it even more than it was so and as you can see right here it goes from softer material to a harder material right here also so that he didn't hurt his ankles and didn't hurt himself again even worse than what it already was in this season after he hurt himself and the carbon fiber here is there's carbon fiber here to reinforce when you play basketball in them. So you don't so you're not sliding all over the place. See it's firm in place there. So you're not sliding all over the place when you're cutting and doing good moves. And as you can see on the on the back right here, it's got the Kobe logo. And then there's nine, you'll see nine of those red dot marks right there, is because that's how many stitches Kobe actually got in his Achilles when he tore it. So the doctor put nine stitches and he thought that'd be cool to put show you guys like the nine that he got and show just to resemble his injury that he got and him coming back from the next season. So yeah, here's the full look on these. And that is all, thank you. In 2014, Nine Star started working with Greenfield Central Radio and TV class. Nine Star helps with funding, equipment, and upkeep costs. In return, teacher Bill McKenna makes shows for the cable company and creates jobs for students in class. I, being one of the students getting to work with John Painter, the producer of Nine Star, filming high school sports around central Indiana. John recently had the chance to sit down to talk about his experiences with students of Greenfield Central. Uh, hey John, thanks for coming in. Uh, I know yeah, it's been a here. really long day and you have a lot of busy things going on and you had this brief time to come in. Um, and we, we do a lot of things outside of school. We record uh, games. Uh, we went to Lucas Oil Stadium and recorded a high school game. We've even done bowling. So how is it uh, working with, the main, the main crew is consist of my classmates. How is it working with teenagers? Well, uh, it's great, and uh, you know, I'll tell you, you got to realize that when Nine Star started this thing a couple years ago, um, I was put into this role, and and I had never done it either. So, so the cool thing about it was that that uh, myself, along with you, with you young men, were able to uh, we learned together mm -hmm. because I didn't I didn't know a whole lot about it either. So, so we've all learned together, you know, and and. Bill McKenna was the only one on the crew that, that had the experience, so we had to we had to take some of his advice and, and his guidance, and and, and we've all um, learned this thing together. And I think we've done really good. Um, uh, we've come a long way. And with all the experience, do you think that you were to, you would uh, were you ever working with teenagers? Well. You know, I, I guess I'd never really thought about it, but but I think one thing about that is uh, maybe that's a good thing, is because we were all new at this, and sometimes when you get experienced people to, to, to come in and, and work with you, um, they're already set in their ways and uh, set in their habits, and um, so we, all of us being new, we had the ability to do it the way we wanted to do it, and, and we all formed our our habits together and and I think it's it's made a good chemistry for for that and uh, I think we got a pretty good team now so what's the differences between working with high schoolers and adults well kind of like what I said with adults you know sometimes they're stubborn and and they've done it their way for for so long and um, 
it's hard to change some of those things. So we haven't had to, uh, to worry about that. Um, uh, again, um, we're all new, and so um, working with adults, again, a lot of times it's their way or the highway. Yeah. And uh, so did, you, did you think it was a good idea at the beginning, working with teenagers? Yeah, I did. I think because Nine Star really, uh, they wanted to have their own channel. Of course, that was their motive for doing what we do. But they also are very interested in in the high schools that we serve and those students that go there. And and so their motive was twofold: is to have a channel, but also to work with with the kids, and and hopefully, you know we can uh, aid in those kids becoming something in broadcasting if that's what their desire is. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a great idea and I think it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, having worked with us over almost two years, what have you learned for working with us? With us? Well, you know, we've all learned a lot, but um, you know, with kids, you've got to keep them focused. You guys are, your, your generation is, is overstimulated. Mm -hmm. Everything, you know, ha something has to be moving or making a noise or flashing or what to, to keep your attention. And, um, um, you know, with video games and social media and all the things that you guys have access to, that's not where my generation came from. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed even because I have children of my own that I'm raising and, and that it's hard to keep them focused on something that's not, you know, exploding or, or being loud. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, so I have that in mind when I work with guys your age, but, um, you know, I think your focus now is 10,000 times better than it was the first game we did. And, um, and it's good. It's getting you out of that social media video game thing for a while and, and allowing you to, to put some talents together, so. With all the sports that we've recorded together, what is your favorite? Well, probably football as far as doing the broadcast. It's, it's more laborious than, than any other sports, and, and the games last longer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think with football, you can do more, you know, with the sideline reporting and the graphics and stuff, you can do a little bit more, you know. It's spread out. With basketball, it's more contained and everything happens quick, you know, and coaches are on and off and stuff, but probably football. So what's your favorite memory with all of us? Favorite memory? Well, I don't know. I have several. You know, the, <laughs> the weather <laughs> is, is memorable. Yeah. We, we've went through some very nasty uh, weather nights, and, and you guys had it worse than I because I was usually in the truck. In the truck. But, um, but, you know, after it's done and you're warm and dry the next day, it's fun to look back and, and watch the film and how you guys had to battle through the weather. So those are memorable. You know, when we do double headers and we're together pretty much most of the day, when we have an afternoon and evening and mm -hmm. we're able to go eat or something, uh, th those are cool days where we, where we have time to do something other than work, where we can kind of just sit down and socialize. So there's a couple things, yeah. Now, when I was going to ask you this question, I was thinking about Captain Panic. I thought that was going to come right to your mind right at that moment. And I was like, man, should I ask him that question? Should I not? And I thought that if I didn't ask that question, it would be too good to pass up. So <laughs> um, what did, happened? Did, what was your favorite moment? Let me ask you first. Um, well, that was not my favorite moment. Uh, man, you just caught me off guard, and I didn't <laughs> expect any of that. But uh, my favorite moment was our first soccer game that we did. It was in Night Sound, I believe. And I was doing graphics. It was the first time that we did graphics, I believe. And I just remember how easy it was. And, I was. and that's one of the reasons why I did it at the football game. And there's a lot more in football than there is in soccer. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for coming in. Out well, of your sure. Busy schedule. Sure. Let's let's keep it going because I'm having fun with it, and hopefully you guys are too. Maybe next time. <laughs> All right. All right.